going to do this the way I teach my class. Except that I'm going to stop and explain what I'm doing. And the reason I do that is that if I don't teach this the way I teach my class, I turn into one of those people, and I, I, I did it one time, I saw it. They lectured for two hours on active learning. We didn't take a break, <laughs> and there was a PowerPoint presentation the entire time. I took lots of copious notes. Um, and then at the end, he said, any questions? None of us had questions, and so we left. And I, my only question was, how in the world would you lecture about active learning for two hours? So what I want to do is this is how I do my classes. The, the difference is going to be I'm going to stop and explain what I do. Because I find that if I don't do that, if you pick some things up, which I hope you will, and say, ooh, I'm going to do that in my class, it may not work real well if you don't understand some of the delicate things I put in there that make it work. And so for as a really, really quick example is if somebody here asks a question or, or offers a response, I might, as he's answering, kind of walk over here saying, oh, that is really good. I like that. Huh, well, that's very good. OK, well, can anybody add on to that? And of course, what I did was several things right there. By, turning, by making him turn, I drew the audience in or the class into him. Otherwise, you have people in the front row who will forget there's a whole class behind them. The class here feels like they're lurking on a conversation if I stay up front. Also, by coming around here, he has to talk louder so that I can hear him. So his volume will actually increase as I walk away, but I maintain eye contact so it's not like I'm ignoring him. The other thing is, as I stroll over here and say, that is really good. Oh, I like that. These guys know what's coming next. <laughs> Anybody can add on to that? And you've been thinking about it before it actually even you get called on. So the reason I stopped and would explain something like that is if I just do it, you might leave here saying, oh, that was a lot of activity. That was some good stuff. And then you try doing the same thing, but stay up behind the lectern and it won't work. So I'll do that periodically. What that means, and I have to take a couple minutes to, to kind of lay this all out or the thing kind of falls apart, is that means it's going to feel a little disjointed for some of you. Because we'll be in the middle of doing something, and I'll stop and say, OK, did you see what just happened there? And then we'll kind of do this narrator scene where it's like, let's talk a little bit about what just happened, and then we'll come back to the activity. So those of you with a little bit of ADD, you're actually going to have fun today. Those of you without, you know, it's time you suffered just a little. So I think that'll do. All right. Oh, one last thing. If you have any questions, please ask them as soon as you have them. If I don't call on you immediately, it's just because I'm trying to finish a thought. So if I look right at you and your hand is up and I kind of nod a little bit, then you know I'm going to call on you. Just give me 30 seconds to a minute to kind of find the, the, the break where I can say, OK, yes, what would you like? But do ask as we go along. It also makes no sense to save your, I mean, if there's one thing, and I apologize to anybody in here I offend with this one, um, if, if one thing that always catches me is when someone says, okay, please hold all questions to the end. I say, but they won't be relevant then. Um, and so that issue of just ask questions whenever you have them. Okay, the apathy thing. The way I got started in apathy, I was asked to guest lecture once. And when I guest lectured, I thought, how am I going to do this? The guest lecture was, how do we process information? How can you help the students so they can be better at learning? Because it's a crazy thing. I mean, there's certain things that we as humans don't process very well. Number one is thinking about our own thinking, metacognition. I'll talk about that one in the afternoon one. But thinking about our thinking. We do things and don't even realize we're doing them. You start to go to the grocery store and you end up, you're at work on Saturday. And it's like, why am I halfway to the office I'm, or to the school? I don't know why. So we don't know why we do some of the things we do. Um, so it's, it's kind of helping students to process that. But we don't teach our students how to learn. We assume they've learned that in high school. If you've ever caught yourself saying, I can't believe the students can't write an essay. This is so frustrating. I can't believe they can't write the essays. This is so frustrating. The next semester, you're reading essays. This is ridiculous. Somebody needs to teach them how to write essays. I have a little rule for myself. About the fourth or fifth time I complain about something, if it's within my control to do something about it, I start doing something about it. So now I teach my students how to write essays. What's really cool, we are working in a whole profession where with the exception, and we could argue about this a little bit, but with the exception of some clinical skills and some research skills, nobody is taught how to do their jobs. I mean, who teaches the president of a university to be a president? Well, they're a good faculty member oftentimes, and they become a chair, which nobody really teaches them how to be a chair. And then they become a dean. Nobody really taught them how to be a dean. And then they become maybe a provost, and then maybe a president. I was just talking to a chancellor, James Mieser, at, at 
at Chapel Hill, and, and we're running a little workshop on training leaders to be leaders, and the first thing he said was, nobody ever taught me how to be a leader. It was all trial and error. Teaching, trial and error. Students, trial and error. So we're like in this really effective business where it's all trial and error. Um, and how do we succeed? We don't assess. Now, <laughs> side thing. All right, so here's the deal. Guest lecturing in this class. I thought, I want to teach students how they process information and what goes on there. So what I'd like to do is come up with something that catches their attention. You know that feeling like, bam, I want to know that thing. You go by a billboard and you don't know what it is, so you look it up. You read the, uh, um, something in the paper and you think, I want to know more about that. So I thought one way of doing that would be a little magic trick. So I went to, and you can get this off the YouTubes if you want to, but I went to a newspaper, clipped a little article out. Now, here's what I need to do here real quickly is I just want to make a line here so we don't get mixed up with which is the front, which is the back of this article, so the front and the back there. Okay, so I've got an article. Here's how I did it right in class. There were 20 students in class. Well, just imagine 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, kind of like the first three rows. So I went into there and I said, okay, everybody, before I get started, I want to show you a really quick little magic trick. So I got a newspaper clipping. I'm going to take a card that is blank and write a word on it. Now, keeping it right here. Now, I give this to a trustworthy person. Yeah, I don't think so. Okay. You. <laughs> oh, don't you. look. Oh. It's nothing personal. You just looked a little shifty. Okay. I like how you say nothing personal and it's supposed to make it okay. <laughs> now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to cut this newspaper clipping, and what I need to have somebody do is just yell cut when I get to any spot you want me to cut. Now, I'm going to look at it just long enough to line up the scissors so I don't take out my, my fingers here, because if there's one thing that we worry about in the medical school area is an ADD person with scissors. <laughs> so, all right, ready? Get ready here. Wait, I'm not lined up yet. Okay, I'm gonna line, okay somebody say cut. Okay, now, I'm staying away from that. Could you please pick that up and tell us, tell me, yeah, 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 that's good. And what's the first word in that article where I just cut it? Um, financial. Financial. Okay, now if you could take a look at that card and what I write on there? Financial. Ooh. Anybody interested in how that was done? Yeah. Raise your hand if you're interested. That was like less than half. Never mind. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. I thought that would work. Okay, here's the deal. Now, I'm going to come right back to this in a second. First order of business. I did it just like that. And I said, okay, raise your hand if you'd like to know how that's done. And I did it a little bit slow. Okay, raise your hand. First thing you need to do on your piece of paper there is write a number down from 0 to 20 out of 20 students. How many students do you think raised their hand? Keeping this in mind, intro level class fall semester. As soon as I'm done, the teacher is going to go back to teaching. So I'm a guest presenter, but as soon as I'm done, they're going to start, he's going to start teaching again. And I don't know, I think that's all the relative information. And that was the first time I ever guest lectured in this group. So what number would you put? Put down a number. Got to write down a number here. All right. I got a number. Now, with your numbers, find people in, I don't know, groups of four or five. Four to five would be ideal. You guys can just spin around here. It would work out well. But about four or five people. And what I'd love to have you do in just a few seconds, compare. Well, first of all, and I'm sorry. Again, I apologize for getting overly excited about this. If you don't know who the four or five people are, just introduce yourself very quickly. And then look at the numbers and compare what numbers you have. Yeah. All right. That was just a quick comparison there. Let's see where you ended up. So just as kind of the range, what kind of numbers did you come up with? So where was your high and low number? What about you folks? From what to what? 4 to 12. 4 to 12. Okay, 4 to 12. That's quite a difference. Yes? 5 to 20. Ooh, 5 to 20. 5 to 20. And you 10 got, to 20. 10 to 20. You guys? 15 to 21. Yeah. 20. Oh, 20. Well, <laughs> could have been 21, but that would have been, okay. You guys? 5 to 20. 7. 7 to 20. 7 to 20. And then the last two groups? Oh, really? Oh, the, by the door. It's perfect. Yeah. See? <laughs> They're going to scoot here in a few minutes. <laughs> Not as good as I thought. We're going to get out of here. Okay. It, oh, this is great. You're right by the pessimist. And you're 13 to 20, and you're like 2 to 7. That is great. I'm not sure why you would be in the back. Um, well, it doesn't matter. We'll get into that later. Okay. So look at the, um, but the ranges are amazing. 5 to 20. 7 to 20, even 2 to 7 is, is a bit of a range. Um, 
just real quickly then, somebody who put down like, what's the, anybody put down less than two? Was it two? We had some twos though, right? So why would you put down a two? Any, I'm, were you the two? No, I was. I, I can't count higher than four. So. <laughs> <laughs> so half of the highest number you can count to? That's pretty cool. All right, just because of, just didn't think they'd raise their hands, right? I mean, it was, why would you put a two down? Okay. Oh, that's it. Okay. Well, that'll work. <laughs> All right. How about someone up at the top, twenty-ish? What? I just think everybody would want to know. Why wouldn't and, you? And you weren't the, the teacher, so you wouldn't be intimidated. Oh, that's a good point. So that's true. It'd be a little less intimidating, perhaps. Okay. One other one. I just thought everybody was okay. One All right. Great. Okay. That's very good. All right. Before we get actually back to the real answer here, so how many of you would actually like know how that was done? Raise your hand. I'll see, that's almost everybody now. Okay, good. The first time I asked that question, how many of you really don't care? Maybe. All right. I'm still, still trying to follow what you're saying. Oh, I'm sorry, for what I'm saying? Yeah, go ahead. Oh, no, that's okay. As for how many people want to know how the actual trick was really done? So that was what I was after. So do you want to know? I could show you. All right. It was, so almost all of you. So it was pretty much everybody. Um, number one is I keep asking you how many would like to know that. And then I just said how many would like to know, how many would you not like to know? One of the things I do in class a lot, especially on day number one, is we'll start out with, how many, for how many of you is this a required course? How many is it not required? And what you typically will have is when you say, how many is it required, especially on day one, is maybe a third of the students will raise their hand. It's the same as when you come in and say, so how many of you got through the chapter last night? And maybe four or five hands go up. If you've got 30 people in a room like this and a half a dozen hands go up, it looks like quite a few. But then you see the other side, and it looks like a lot more, or it doesn't necessarily look like a lot more, but you see there's a lot more than what in your head the X minus the group would look like. And it's just, it's a transformation of how it looks in a room. For instance, um, for all the males in the room, I'm just to do a male-female thing. I do this in stats all the time. Males in the room, raise your hand real fast. So you look around, oh, look around, I didn't mean to leave your, leave your hand up just a second. Look around the room, see how many, <laughs> see how many guys we've got. Okay, so quite a few. Now, if we stopped with how many of you struggled with the material last night, we saw that. It'd be very easy to say, okay, well, let's go back over it. But then how many women in the room? Raise your hand. Oh, see, there's more. There's quite a few more. And again, it's, it's, it shows you quickly what's going on. I've done this a lot with students where I've said things like, how many of you struggled with the material a little bit versus got through it pretty easily? How many struggled? And I'll see about a third of the hands go up. How many got through it fairly well? And then two-thirds of the hands go up. And what you can see then is, is, is kind of see what's going on. It's a quick way of surveying. Here's the real trick. If the first time you do that, you're only getting about a third of the hands raised. I'd do it again. How many required? How many not required? Hmm, that's only about a third of you, and I'm really interested in knowing this. How many required? How many not required? All right, that's almost two-thirds of you, so that's better, but I really want to know. Please, help me out here. How many required? How many not required? I've done that up to eight times. Because it was a class that just really didn't feel like raising their hands, and it doesn't help. And so what I did was I did it up to about eight times, making fun of it and joking a bit. I still got to about two people refused to raise their hand. I'm not going to not go on just because two people. So once I got to about 95%, then I moved on. From that point forward, I could ask questions. You know, we have homework due next Tuesday. For how many of you is that going to be fine versus how many could use an extra day or two? How many fine? How many a day or two more? And by doing that, I started getting participation a lot more. I had classroom, people would visit my class when I taught my sections of 200. The number one thing that anybody who visited my class, because I just opened my class, I'd come anytime you want to, the number one thing that people would say is, how do you get so much participation from 200 students? And part of it is that I expect it, starting on day one. Look, everybody, I really want to know how many of this, how many of that. Get into small groups. If they're not into small groups, I walk up and talk to them real quickly. So the point is just keeping them active is really important. Um, so that's, that's the big issue. Now, back to, the, back to the magic trick thing. The reason I do this in class, and I actually do this thing in class, anytime I teach statistics, which is by far my favorite course to teach, um, history of psych I use it. I use it in my intro psych class. Those are the three classes I primarily teach. You could use it in just about any class to start conversations. In statistics on day one, almost, I shouldn't say almost, many of the students are very nervous about the class. Many of the students are just not happy about the class. There's, if you take the, the total sum of individuals in a psychology required psych stats class that are both happy about being there 
and excited about the, what they're going to learn. I mean, happy in general, just and, and, and thinking I can do this material. Out of a class this size, it maybe be two. So if I start out saying, okay, everybody, what we're going to do in here is we're going to study statistics and statistical processes. We're going to do analysis of variance and one sample t-test, and we're going to do correlation and some chi-square. This is going to be exciting stuff. <laughs> they don't, uh-uh. So I start with this. Now, very quickly, I've already talked about ranges in here. If we started out with, and I didn't take the time to do it, but in my class I would have. Which group had the biggest range, by the way? And if we did that, and the student said, oh, I think the group over there that was 5 to 20. But we had 2 to 13, so we were close. All right, now we're talking about ranges. We could talk about highs and lows. We could talk about medians, or not medians. We could talk about the means of the groups. You could take it. I could have them calculate a mean real quickly. Hey, by the way, just add up how the, the, the numbers in your group and then divide by how many people in your group. And I want to find out what the average is for each group. I can be doing that on day one. And then about, and, it, and this is great. So then I explained to them, okay, those of you who are really, really nervous about statistics, we're not going to get to that for almost a week, calculating measures of central tendency. That comes in like chapter two, chapter three. So don't worry, we'll get there. But you're already ahead of everybody, or ahead of the, the book. And that relaxes them completely. It's just amazing. So I use it for that critical thinking. You can come back real quickly right now. I use this for uh, classes whenever I teach critical thinking and say, how is it that I might have been able to do this trick? And I have the students come up with testable hypotheses. And they'll jot down what they think I might have done. And then we can go about doing, um, talking through how we would actually test that. Um, so that's another possibility. If you want to, and I'll show you how you can do this, you can manipulate it so the word on the card is the major word that you want to kick your class off with. Say, OK, now I've got your attention. Let's talk about financial for just a minute. So there's ways of playing around with this one. By the way, so back to this whole thing. Zero was the number. Not a single student raised their hand. I did the trick. I said, how many of you would like to know how I did that? Now remember, I did it in this class just to catch their attention and get that whole process going of what does it mean to really want to know something? Nobody raised their hand. I thought, oh crud, this is the best thing I have today. Because that was my starter. I said, okay, well, let's move on. And so I moved on. Young lady in the front said, all right. If you want to tell us, I th I'll listen. <laughs> oh, push the whole nother button for me. <laughs> oh, can I please do that service for you? Could I please explain something to you? Because that's what I live for. You can't say those things, but it was going on there. And then there was a guy on the other side who said, you know you want to tell us, just do it. <laughs> now I thought, you know what? No, I'm not going. I was going to tell you, and now I'm not going to. And then I, what I told him was, at the end, when we get to the end, if you really want to know, you have to remember, and then I will show you because I just pissed. And so <laughs> I moved on. I did the whole presentation. I got to the end, and at the end, the instructor said, any questions? They asked a couple questions about learning and everything. I said, okay, well, we're out of time. And it was right on time to go. And the one person, the same young lady in the corner, says, um, excuse me, um, you were going to show us how to do that magic trick? I said, oh, well, if, you would like, <laughs> if you'd like to see it, I guess I can show it to you. Um, I had to do that because of how she worded it. But I, I did it nicely. And um, I said, okay, the rest of you go ahead and go. The two of you who ask can stay, unless you want to stay. All 20 of them stayed. They were all interested. Now, the reason I started out with that, and I wanted to run through this quickly, too, is because this is really, really important. Even back to when we were students, now I know we got very different ages in here. There's some variability there, too. Um, when I was a student, though, and I'm just going back to, like, the 70s, it wasn't all that cool to be excited in the classroom. Some students were, some weren't, whatever. But to, to be the one that sits in the front row saying, ooh, 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 call on me, call on me, nah, not so much. Now it's getting worse and worse. And I really, I have a hypothesis, but I don't have the data yet. If any of you have a study, I'd love to see it. I think all the texting and IMing and everything else is killing our interpersonal affective um, nonverbal communication. Um, that concept of saying, I looked over my daughter's shoulder one time and she typed, nah, LOL. I said, LOL, isn't that laugh out loud? She said, yeah. I said, you never even smiled. <laughs> she said, who'd see it? <laughs> it's like, why laugh and smile? Now, I still do. It's like, ah, this is so funny. But I'm watching students who are typing with no affect, typing 90 miles an hour. I think that's coming into the classrooms, too. So the point is, your students might actually be less apathetic than you think. They just have to act apathetic so that they look like they fit in with the rest. 
Oh, by the way, one young man leaving my intro psych class. I love this. Final exams, they're turning them in. I stand by the door to say, thank you for being in class. You know, hope to see you around. This is my class of 200. And so I'm, I tell them they all have to leave by one door. I can't talk to everyone, but I talk to lots of them. I do that, by the way, almost on a daily basis. I stand by the door as they come in and as they go out. Point here is, as he's leaving, I don't know if you care, but this is like the coolest class ever. <laughs> and he walked out the door. I never saw him again in my whole life. He had sat in the back row his entire semester acting like he was just irritated about stuff. Um, I had one guy a few years ago that said, you know, your class is my biggest challenge. I said, what's that? He said, I try my hardest to look disinterested in all my classes, but in your class, I'm so interested, at times I catch myself nodding and smiling. I think, oh my gosh, that's terrible. Um, but that's, so be careful of that whole mentality. It's an important thing to have going on, that the mentality there. Now, a um, couple of quick things. Uh, not a couple of quick things, let's get rolling here with this. Can we cut the light? Can you turn the lights down here? I just want to show this one real quickly. Um, in terms of, this is one of my favorite illusions. Now, I'm not going to spend much time on it. It's actually on the end of the um, handout. But it's done by Adelson. If you go to Adelson and type in Adelson and illusions, it'll pop up his whole site. He has all kinds of really cool ones. But I like to show this one for illustrative purposes on how our brain works real quickly. B and A. See this gray right here and this gray right here? exactly the same shades of gray. They're the same darkness. Now, I've looked at this thing for the longest time, and B looks lighter than A to me. So I'm just going to be, I have to ask the question real quickly. How many see it as the same versus different? How many of you does A and B look like it's the same shade of gray? Raise your hand. So one does, a couple. Okay, how many of it does look different? Raise your hand. All right, so that's good. So it's all about, a, and there's a couple of people that will. Now, why does A and B look so different? Well, first of all, I've got to show you that they are the same. All I did was I went into the little toolbar and I drew in some black squares, well, rectangles, actually. So I put one there, then I put one there, I put one there, I put one there, I put one there. Now, I still find that amazing. Now, we could do, and I can't do this because timing and everything. I love to do this. And I show this one to my students and say why, not just why this happens. What's going to happen when we take the boxes away? You know how you all of a sudden see something that was never there before, and then you can't not see it? You, someone illustrates a point or shows you something in a painting. It's like, I never noticed that, knew, knew, noticed that about the painting, but now every time I look at it, it pops right out. And ask the students. When I take these black boxes away, is it going to go back to the way it was, or will they now look more similar? And you have them talk back and forth for just a few minutes. What do you think is going to happen? I love doing the quick pair shares in my class. I'm not a big one. This presentation is not on group work. That's a whole different thing. Group work is when you put people into groups and have them do big projects. The stuff I like to do are just quick engagement activity things. Get people hanging in there. If you have trouble with folks in laptops, for instance, I don't have trouble with folks in laptops. First of all, I keep them, you know, turn to your neighbor and talk about this. And as they turn to their neighbor, I oftentimes, especially in classes of 30 or 40, will see people turn over and say, so what are we supposed to do? And if I see someone with a laptop open, and I know you haven't been using it for other purposes, so I'm just going to pick on this because it's open. But I might come over here, and if he turned to her and said, um, what are we supposed to do again? I said, ah, you guys go ahead and work. I'll explain it to you. <laughs> And it only takes, and I'm not being mean, it's just why would you interfere with their learning if you haven't been paying attention? And then I just explain it real quickly. I can do it very nice and very helpful, and the next time I go back to doing this stuff, I look over and he's paying attention. And if he's not paying attention or if she's not paying attention, then I do it again. And the point is here is I keep them engaged. The other thing I will do is periodically I'll stop and say, now, this first came about with a lot of illusions done by the Gestaltists back in the 1950s. Oh my gosh, Cooler. When did Cooler... Um, could you please look up the uh, Gestalt psychologist in the 1950s and tell me what year Cooler published his first work? Could you do that real quickly? If someone has their laptop open. And it's great because they're going like this. Excuse me? What do you want? Yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, 1954. It'll take them a minute. While it takes them a minute, I go on. Then they'll say, oh, it's 1954. I say, thank you so much. And then if you look, you don't need a magic eye to see what they're doing. You can tell. If you haven't done this, by the way, huge importance. If I've got a laptop open right now, 
and you're teaching, and I'm going like this, I'm mostly paying attention, and I'm taking notes. Good evidence, by the way, people with ADD do better if they take notes on their computer than if they do it with paper and pencil. Helps them focus for some quirky reason. So if you say no laptops in the classroom, you're basically disadvantaging some group. So just be careful with that one. I mean, you can do it if there's, not, if there's too much distraction, but be careful with it. But the point is, if I'm doing that, now, you can't see my screen, but if I'm doing this, <laughs> you don't need to see my screen. You know that I'm texting people. If I'm going like this, you know what I'm doing, right? <laughs> and of course, I could be just going like this. Now you know I'm watching YouTube clips. What I love to do, because I'm a parent, and being able to freak out your kids is really important, and that's when they don't know where you get your knowledge. So here's the deal. I might catch you as you're leaving class and say, you know, actually, on the last couple of exams, you've gotten C's, and I really think if you'd stop watching YouTube clips during class, you'd do better. And I've had students actually look at me and say, how, how, how did you know I was watching YouTube clips? That's not important right now. You never tell them. You just say, that's not important. But the point here is keeping them engaged. So keeping them engaged. Now, so you can talk them through, talk through why is A, or do you think A and B is different? Have them turn to their neighbors. If they've been on the, on, on the YouTube clips, they'll have to explain that they get back involved in the classroom. Here's the answer, though. Now, pretty much goes back to the way it was, um, which is fine. It does that, and when you have people talk it over, you explain why, but the point here is, it's a very powerful illusion. So now I'm going to ask you real quickly, why is this so powerful? What's, what's happening here that causes B and A to look different? Anybody got a quick response here? It's the which? The background. The background, sure. A is covered by white light areas, primarily, and B is primarily covered with dark areas. That's contrast. Contrast is really important in our processing system. There's another one though that's even more powerful. And it comes into play in all of our classrooms. Do you know why they look different? The shadow. Perfect. Where is the light coming from? You know what's neat? Nobody taught you where light comes from in terms of perspective and stuff. Your brain picks that up. Because movement and light are two of the most important things for you as a human being. A parked car will probably never hurt you unless you run into it. A moving car, you can be standing still and get hurt. Moving things have more information. If you're walking across campus and it's really, really dark, and all of a sudden you see some movement off to the side, your brain picks that up. We're actually wired to pick up movement better than we are um, stationary objects. So me moving around... If you've ever heard it's important to move around in the classroom, that's part of it. Your brain will actually shut down stationary information because it has low value. So if I stood right here and talked to you about the importance of teaching and learning and made sure to keep my voice as non-fluctuating as possible and actually didn't move, your brain's not only, well, we'd be a little bored, but it'd be a physiological mechanism. Your brains actually start to shut down the information. It's really pretty cool. In fact, I do some experiments with my students at times to see how long I can go before they start nodding off. And you can see already the difference in the room. It doesn't take much. So that's why moving around and varying your voice and everything is important. So where the light comes from. Light is very important. So the last thing I want to show you on this demonstration, look around the room real quickly. This is so cool. I love this part. If you look around the room and look at the colors of the room, the affect in the room, and everything else, it's got a level to it. And the reason I point this out is because when I walk around and just watch classrooms, I can't tell you what proportion, but it's high, of rooms will do PowerPoint. They turn the lights off and they hit the PowerPoint. If you're teaching an art a history course and you're showing really intricate paintings, you need to do that with a $15,000 projector. Lights all down. If you're showing cross-sections of, of tissue, then you need the lights down. You need it very, very bright. If what you're really showing people is this, 
you don't need a screen that looks beautiful and everything is really wonderful. What you need is to make sure the affect in the room is in the right place. So watch what happens now. This is kind of neat. If you, if you look around the room a little bit and go ahead and kick the lights back up, watch your eyes. It might hurt a little bit because of the brightness. And all. You'll notice that just takes, that now takes on much less value. A minute ago, that was the brightest thing in the room. And because it's the brightest thing in the room, your brain will process that as being the most important thing in the room. I've just made you much more important in this room relative to this. So just be careful how you use the lights in your room. It's a really, really important thing to be careful of. Okay, now, this is good because I've only taken 40 minutes to get to the first slide. <laughs> it's like a new record for me. Um, I want to hit this really, really fast because we have lots to do in the old Willy Wonka thing. So little to do and so much time. Um, so I want to run through these things really, really fast just to hit these because I think it's really important. In terms of engagement in the classroom, I tell you, the number one thing you can do, I can teach you all kinds of toolbox kind of tricks, raising hands, meeting people at the door kind of things, turn to your neighbor and talk. Those are all really good. The best thing you can do is create a really good learning environment for the students where they feel comfortable sharing and participating. So really fast, I'm going to go through these and ask you for some assistance. Um, and our goal is to do these in about six minutes or so. So can't do that. Let's take seven minutes. Contact between students and faculty. What's one thing anybody in here has done to increase contact between you and your students? Yes. Oh, meet you after class, groups of 10, juice and cookies. I'm only repeating it because we're taping it and I want to make sure they get that. So, meeting with class afterwards. And one more? Learn the name and uh, talk to them. Perfect. Not personal questions, but yeah. how they're doing, how the semester going. That's very good. Learning them and, and just getting to know them a little bit. I, I know faculty in classes of less than 30 require their students to come and see them in their office once in the first two weeks. If you've ever gone to your office, or not gone to your office, if you right now, and I'm not going to ask anybody to raise your hands, say, you know, I have office hours, but the students just never come. If you would like them to not come, that's perfect. You got what you want. <laughs> Sometimes I just want to do my email and be left alone. That's why I have office hours. See how that works? If that's the case. If you want them to come, then make them come. You don't have to say, you must come to my office. Just say, hey, everybody, I want each of you to come by and see me at least once before the third week is up. On their exams, write down, I see you're struggling a little bit. Please stop by and see me at my next office hour or within the next week. Something to bump them in your direction. But, but just some kind of contact, going in and talking to the students. There's wonderful evidence that this is one of the best things you can do with respect to the rapport in your classroom. Reciprocity and cooperation, just getting the students to work with one another. Another huge one. These two together, getting people to know one another, other human beings. There are a lot of students who will come into a class, even this size, and at the end of the semester, here's one I always ask myself. At the end of the semester, how many names does the average student know of people in this classroom? How many names does the average student know? And now I kind of do whatever I can to bump that up. So it's not just me learning the names. I want you to know each other. I can do that by putting you in small groups, by having you wear name tags for a little while, all kinds of things. Talk to one another using your first names. Just getting them to connect with one another. Huge, huge thing. Active learning, anything you can do to get people involved in the classroom is good. Kind of connecting with one another. I'll come back to that. Um, prompt feedback. Getting information back to students as quickly as possible. Now when I say as quickly as possible, prompt has two key characteristics to it. It's got to get back there before they need the information. I mean, you get it to them when they need it, I guess you should say. So if you have a weekly quiz, every Monday, you've got a Monday, Wednesday class, and every Monday you have a quiz. Monday I give you the quiz. Wednesday, sorry, I didn't get your quiz back to you. Then I give it back to you the following Monday when you take quiz two. That means quiz one feedback was late because you needed it to know how to study for quiz two. The other one is promised. If I tell you it'll be done on a Monday, Wednesday, Friday class, on Monday I say I'll have it done for you on Friday. If I don't have it done on Friday, then it's not prompt. Or let's go this way. Suppose I told you Wednesday. This is the sneaky part. I tell you Wednesday, then I'm saying, I'm sorry, I don't have it done. I'll have it to you on Friday. It's no longer prompt just because of definition. I told you it'd be done, it's late. If I tell you Friday but get it to you Wednesday, it's early. But if I get it to you Friday, then it's on time. This is how mechanics work. 
when you drop your car off and they say, well, have your car done on Tuesday, you say, but I need my car. Sorry, it's a big job. Then they call you Monday afternoon and say it's done. It's like, whoa, it's early. But if they tell you it'll be done Monday at noon and call you Monday afternoon, then it's late. So if it, you push the date out a little bit, but just prompt feedback there. And then time on task. Anything you can do to keep the students working on the material, really important. Um, I like web quests, getting people to go out and, and like go, on the, go online. I put people in small groups. Bring your laptops to class, during class. Go online, find the best thing you can out about Sigmund Freud, something you don't think the rest of us know. Every group's got the same assignment, go. And 15 minutes later, we see what you've got. Sometimes for homework, now I say time on task there because they're really working on it. For homework, one of the assignments I started years ago, I love this one. Send me a YouTube clip of something that we're covering in the next class period. Something we're covering in the next class period that illustrates the points really well. And in one sentence, why did you send this to me? What, what about it caught you? I've had students where I've had to go back and tell them, don't spend so much time doing that. <laughs> Now, by the way, I also give them extra credit. Those of you who don't believe in extra credit, um, it's all a framing issue. I don't believe in bumping students' grades way up based on material done outside of class. I think they should do, if it's important enough, I make it part of class. But students keep bugging me about extra credit, so I finally conceded and said, okay, fine. I used to have my class was worth about 200 points. I bumped my class up to being worth 1,000 points five exams, they're worth like 150 points a piece, I have a paper worth 100 points, and in all of that mix, you can get 20 points of extra credit out of the 1,000 points in the class. Now, I'm not inflating my grade anymore, and the students seem very happy, because they can't really differentiate between a point, if there's 100 points in class, or if there's more. By the way, you can go to an extreme, extreme and be careful with this. I have a friend of mine who made his class worth a million points. <laughs> This was so cool. Think about this for a minute. If you go to the play downtown and write a one-page summary, I will give you 5,000 extra credit points. And the students would say, 5,000 points? And my students, I might say, you can have two points. A friend of mine was like one point. They're not going to go downtown and write a summary for one point. They will do it for 5,000 points. So it's pretty cool. The sad thing is you've got to be careful doing that, though. Because if they get something wrong on a test, you may have to like subtract 40,000 points. <laughs> that freaked them out. Um, but getting them to do these clips and sending them in, really, really important. Communicating high expectations. This is a basic human thing. It's, it's whatever you can do to say, I know you can do this. Here's, I'm going to give you the framework, but I expect a lot out of you. I happens to be, and I don't like to use this reference very much, but um, I'm at a school that started to play basketball again. Um, <laughs> took a year off. Uh, <laughs> but good old Roy Williams, I watch him very carefully on the side, and I'm pretty sure that he doesn't say, you know, guys, you're pretty good and you're doing the best you can, so keep at it. <laughs> no, no, it's, he communicates very high expectations. A little too much at times. Well, it's a different thing. Um, and in different, diverse ways in knowing. Um, just keeping it mixed up is really, really important. Variety is a huge thing when it comes to classes and teaching and learning. So, I want to go through these pretty quickly. These are the types of things that you can do to really kind of bump up your class and create community, which is really, really important. I want to try something really, really fast, and then we're going to take a break. So here's what we need to do. We're going to do our groups of four or five again, so we'll have to turn your chairs and stuff. So first of all, identify like, a group of four or five people you think you can tolerate for the next few minutes. It could be the same <laughs> one you just add. And then you need one piece of paper... Hmm. If you didn't, if you brought paper, each group just needs one piece they can write on. If you're really stuck, you can use the back of the evaluation. Um. Now, this is something I use in my classes all the time. I learned this from Barbara Millis. Barbara Millis is in Texas. Um, I've adapted a little bit differently, but she does some great stuff on group learning, group work. Um, Barbara Millis has written books on cooperative learning. She has a lot of that. This is something I've used in my class for about the last five years. And here's how it goes. Everybody got that? Okay. And please don't adapt the instructions because they're more efficient. There's a reason I do all of this right now. And I'll explain why in just a minute. So we need one piece of paper per group. For that piece of paper, what you're going to do is I'll give you the prompt. Once I give you the prompt, you write down what your response would be and tell the group, because sometimes handwriting is not all that good, say, I'm writing down sleeping in class. 
and you write that down, then pass it to the person to your left. That person says, okay, I'm going to write down and put whatever you're writing down, and then you pass it. Go as fast as you can. We're only going to do this for about a minute, so you want to go as fast as you can. If it makes it all the way around, then keep going around. Go around again and again, however fast you can do this. And we're going to see how many people, how many things you can get on your list. Now, do not write until I say go. The prompt is, what behave, don't write anything yet. What behaviors illustrator are good examples of something an unmotivated student might do? Here's my cognitive behavioral background. I don't care about what you're thinking. What behaviors illustrate that the student is either not interested, unmotivated, apathetic? What behaviors? All right, now. What I want to do is come back. This is a brainstorming technique that I like to use in class. I'm going to explain to you why we're using it and what we just found on your list. But I could never get my students to just brainstorm. Anytime I said, come up with a list of, they would all start debating the stuff on the list. Brainstorming is just get your stuff on the paper first, then let's talk about it. This little thing of passing the paper and moving as fast as you can seems to do that. If it's a complicated question, give them more time. That, by the way, was what one minute and 15 seconds feels like. Um, if it's more of what are, let's see, what are some possible side effects of a certain drug? What bones make up a certain part of the skeleton? What are some possible ramifications of um, economic destability in a certain area? Um, you could have just about anything, but if it's a little bit longer types of issues, you may want to give them five minutes of coming up with as many things as they can. And then once they do that, then you can start talking about them, which is what we're going to do right after this break. Okay, so now. We've done the things, you've gone around, and I, I did that break right when I, I meant to do that in terms of, of, I wanted to get it started to have something go with activity just before you did a break. See, I'd been lecturing for quite a while. This is the part where I told you I'll do the side notes, the commentary every once in a while. This is how I teach a class. In my head, I had been actually lecturing for a bit of time, and I'd gotten off into that for a little longer than I wanted to. But we were covering it pretty quickly. I was doing a little bit of asking questions back and forth, but nothing with really any energy. If I then take the break, that's the perfect time for people to think, um, I think I'm going to go check out some emails, or I think maybe I'll keep walking. There seems to be a lot of lecturing. So what I wanted to do was change up the energy level just before the break. So I had you do that quick activity, but there wasn't enough time to finish the activity. However, what I was hopeful for is the activity be enough to say two things. Number one is, oh, that's pretty cool. I want to see how it's done and what's done with it. And number two, let's see what the outcome of the activity is. But the other part, of course, is just the energy level. So that's why I did that. All the time during class, I'm kind of monitoring the energy level and trying to figure out. And I have kind of in my back pocket lots of little think, pair, share kind of concepts that I can do. Now, for those of you especially relatively new teachers, do not worry that in, in addition to keeping track of the class and doing all this stuff, you're also supposed to be super monitoring everything else and how confusing that can be. This is not a confusing thing. Basically what it is is before I start class, I might do three or four prompts that are at different times of the class period that would say if things need to just be changed up a little bit or if I need a quick break or something, then I'm going to use one of these things. For instance, I could have had one in there that says, what types of activities do you use in your class to really get the students involved? And if I had that off to the side, then to be perfectly blunt, if it came to the first 45 minutes and I thought, I really could use the restroom right now, or, boy, the class seems to have a little lethargy, we're a little dropped a little bit, I could say, I know what we're going to do. Tell you what, let's turn to your neighbor and come up with one idea of something that you use in your class that is really good and active learning and it tends to work really, really well. And after you've talked for about three or four minutes, we're going to report out. All right, well, turn to your neighbor. And you guys would turn to your neighbor. I would have three or four minutes that I could skip out real quickly. I could take a drink. I could whatever I need to do if I need to sort out my next notes. The point is, you can have those ready. And if you don't use them, you just go right by them. So it's not that big a deal, but having those ready is a good thing. All right, now. Does that work in medical school? In which part of medical school? The, the classroom Depends on, I mean, I, I got asked. I'm a big one for which kind. You mean um, the general lecture kind of classroom? Yeah, the massive lecture. Oh, good one. It works really, really well. Actually, it works better. Um, if there's one thing that we can do in medical school is get the students talking to one another a little bit more and get out of a really strict, I have got to teach you 117 things today. Now, I'm glad you brought that one up because I'm going to take the sidestep right now. 
I use the room such that I know that I can't keep going until I get back there. <laughs> I'm on two tangents right now. <laughs> but this one's an important one. If, and I won't ask you to raise your hand, but the number one question I get from people who are really serious about some active learning kinds of things is, but I have so much to cover in class. Okay, number one, if you've got a lot to cover in class, I recommend that you start out reading the book to your students and read the entire book to them. Because that will make sure that they learn it, right? <laughs> no, not necessarily. First of all, you don't have time to read the entire book to them, and they have to learn some things on their own. Oops, I've already got you on the slippery slope now. If they've got to learn some things on their own, the question is what do they have to learn on their own and what do I actually have to explain and teach them? And one of the big issues we run into is if you have to learn of every bone in the body is that I have to teach you every bone in the body. But that's ridiculous, I can't do that. So what I can do is hold you accountable for it and I can teach you how to learn every bone in the body. I would argue that I could teach you a huge amount of anatomy and never talk about anatomy. What I could do is I could say, okay, this time we're going to focus on the ear. We're going to focus on the ear because it has some of the most delicate bones in the entire body. Now, tonight, what I want you to do, I don't care, work alone, get into groups. Research shows groups are better. But by the time you come back to class, I'm going to hold you accountable for the ear. Any questions? And really bright students will say, nope. And then you can talk to them a little bit about other things. But the point here is, now I'm turning the learning over to you. Having you walk through the door and say, okay, get into groups of four and make sure you've got five minutes to make sure you understand the ear. And now you spend five minutes doing that, then I start quizzing people, holding you accountable for the material. So the point there is there's things I can do like that. I'll stop periodically, and this was done actually in the physics department at Harvard, was started, show a multiple choice question. Say, okay, everybody, here's a question that's gonna be very similar to what you're gonna see on your test. First of all, how many think, multiple choice, how many think it's A, how many B, how many C, how many D? If they mostly have it right, say good for you and we move on. You've also shown them how the questions are gonna come out on the exam. So now they know how to study a little bit. But the best part is, if a bunch of them get it wrong, say okay, turn to your neighbor and convince your neighbor of your answer. Now you've got one minute where they turn to their neighbor and think, I think it's really B and here's why. After a minute, you come back and say, okay, now how many A, B, C's and D's? Eric Mazur kept the data. It's amazing in one minute how fast you can shift it. And in a medical school kind of environment, that works really, really well. I'll tell you a little secret. There's a class. Let's call it just some place that I don't know. Um, it's some place way out west. I don't know. Chestnut Hill. <laughs> California. Um, where there's a medical school and they have a class with course capture where now they capture everything that happens in class and stream it so the students can go back over it. The class has 300 students enrolled. Average enrollment or average attendance, I could do the game again where I ask you to estimate it and then talk to your neighbor about what you think it is. Um, I'm just going to cut to the chase for timing. Six. Six people out of 300 showing up for class. 294 deciding to watch it online instead. They came and talked to me a little bit about this and said, we've got a problem here. I said, are your students learning the material? I said, yes, but they're not coming to class. I said, you don't have a problem. They're learning the material. You've created an effective correspondence course. Is that what you want? They said, no, we don't want that. And I said, okay, that you can change. But you notice what I've already done with that whole game? Is what's your outcome? If you want them to learn the material and they're learning it and not coming to class, this is for all of you. If your students don't come to class and learn the material, you have to first ask yourself, does that bug you because it feels like they're not coming to see you? Or does it bug you because they're not learning? And if they're learning and you're okay with that, that's pretty cool. If, however, you want to teach them interactivity and let them see the nuances in the class, then have interactivity and nuances in the class and have them come for that. But the point is, we have to be careful because if it's just dumping material, that'll happen a lot. So, all right, I just want to go on that because uh, the... The content stuff is a big one. It's the one reason people will say, I would do more active learning, but I don't have time. Today hasn't been a phenomenal illustration unless I point out that one thing that I said at the beginning. Notice that I keep taking these side notes to explain to you why I'm doing what I'm doing. This activity that we're in the middle of that we started 20 minutes ago, so far has taken 75 seconds of your time in terms of doing the activity. If you knew what was coming, so I said, okay, we're going to do the paper passing thing, so everybody pull out a piece of paper, get into groups of four or five. Okay, maybe that'll take 30 seconds. Here's your prompt. You got, you got 60 seconds. You're into maybe two minutes of class time, and then you're moving on. So this doesn't have to take a lot of time. 
Let's transport us back to the point where we had been two minutes into this activity. Here's the next thing I would do. I'm now going to ask groups to report out. As you report out, I'm just going to point at a group. You tell me something on your list. If somebody else has the same thing, cross it off your list so there's no repeats. You, if somebody else says sleeping, your group doesn't say sleeping. Cross it off. That keeps things moving. Now, the other thing is, as soon as you read something off the list, pass it to somebody else. You can pass it to the next person. So if I come back to your group, I have somebody else reporting out, so it's not the same person all the time. Okay, so to get it started, everybody, every group, somebody's got to grab their piece of paper. You ready for reporting out? All right, here we go. Oh, ha, I almost forgot. Pass your piece of paper to people to the left. No, two, just two people within your group. Two people to the left. If you got four people in the group, it's hilarious to watch people go left or right. It doesn't matter. It's going to end up halfway back. Now, the reason I do that one is that if you're not careful, what happens is the introverts always push the piece of paper away and the extroverts pick it up. Introverts are individuals who want to think through things and process a little. They don't like getting called on a lot. Extroverts. Extroverts are individuals who begin sentences curious how they might end. Um, they're just people who want to report out. So the point here is I do this with my groups all the time is I'll say pass it to the left. The next time we do this in class I might say hand it to the person to your right. And then the third time I do it, it's mean because you know you want it, the expectation. If you were an introvert on the third time you'd pick up the paper, wouldn't you? Because you're waiting to see which way you pass it. So that's the perfect one to say, okay, let's get going. And I'll actually have students who will say, well, aren't we supposed to pass it? <laughs> but by then, they understand the system, and, and it's okay anyway. So here we go. Let's see what kinds of things are on your list. We'll start right up here in front. What's one off your list? Leaving early. Leaving early. Everybody cross leaving early off your list, and then you would pass that to somebody else. How about you folks here? What have you got on your list? Um, avoid eye contact. Avoiding eye contact is a good one. Cross it off the list, and you guys pass yours. Okay, one over here. Skipping class. Skipping cl Not even coming to class is a good one. And another one for here for you guys? Daydreaming. Daydreaming. So daydreaming comes off the list. Pass it on to daydreaming. Yes, another one? Texting. Texting. Let's do any kind of texting or working on computers and stuff in class. That's a good one. Another one off your list? Eating. Eating during class. That's a good one. And one off your list? Preparing for another class. Preparing for a different class. Doing any kind of outside work. All right, let's go back here. Oh, we'll start at the back this time. That way that we don't have this issue where they're always last kind of things. What's another one off your list? Talking to each other. Side conversations. That's a good one. Side conversations. Another one from you guys? Uh, listening to music. Listening to music. Okay. That's good. Yeah, that's a good one. Okay, another one from you folks? Multitasking. Multitasking. Doing multiple things at the same time. Yes. Sleeping, Sleeping during class. That's always a good one. Another one from you folks? Ah, the old eye rollers. Any kind of nonverbal communication that says something along the lines of this is terrible stuff. All right, another one from you folks? Drawing pictures in the notebook. Oh, drawing pictures in the notebook. That's a very good one. one. You can argue them all in a minute. Okay, another one off your list? Playing games. Playing games is a good one. All right, so the game here is that you just keep going around asking people. I skipped one step just for sake of time, but one other thing you can do which is really effective is pause just before you do the reporting out. Say, in the group, you guys talk it over, and if you don't understand something that's on the list, make sure that everyone in the group understands everything on the list. If you don't understand, ask your things. Don't you guys do it. I don't want to spend the time here right now. But if you do that, then that allows you, as you're having people report out, here's the cool part. As they're reporting out, if you get to a person who never talks in class, it doesn't matter what it is, you can say, oh, that's a really interesting one. Could you explain a little bit more about that? And you don't want them to say, well, that wasn't my item. That was actually Sally's. So you'd say, if you give them a chance to talk about it, you'd say, okay, just tell me real quickly why, why that's on your list. The point there is you can call on people and it doesn't look like you're picking on them. So I'm going to stop with that. Let me just ask generally, anything that on your list that you didn't get to that you think is a really, really pressingly interesting one? Not participating. Okay, not participating. That's very good. Yeah, yeah th th that's one of the big ones I get too, is that people who refuse to engage in active learning kinds of things, which we can get back to in a minute too. Any others? I had a person write a few weeks ago, making out in the back of the classroom. <laughs> oh, yeah. If your students are necking in your room, I'm just telling you, as a colleague, because we're all in this together, do something about it. 
<laughs> just catch them after class. I don't know, bucket of cold water. I don't care. Just get them to stop. Um, someone else? Oh, yes. Um, it depends on how you do it. And that's a really, really good question. So let's take this activity, for instance. If I started out, look at the difference in the feel. And I'm just going to pick, uh, I'm going to pick something that very few of you know, just so you'll have that sense of, of not knowing it. Um, so let's see, psychology is a science. What year did psychology start as a science? Go. 1900. Very good, no. Um, anybody else? What do you think? 1890. No. Um, okay, let's switch gears here because this isn't working out. It's 1879. You were kind of off by long. Okay, now, <laughs> at this point I'm already losing lots of people in my classroom. If you do something like that, there's some people who would say, I like to push them and I like to be edgy. I, the introverts in the crowd absolutely by far hate stuff like that. Because what you're doing is you're calling p on people. It freaks people out anyway. The people who are more shy are now really put on the spot when they're wrong. That was a lot of some of the students, not introverts, but some of the people's fear is looking stupid. By the way, I've done some work with medical school. Number one reason medical students don't like to participate in class, they don't want to look stupid. And they're in medical school. They look smart walking through the door. That's different than intro psych class. <laughs> They got into medical school, so they only have stuff to lose. <laughs> so they, they don't want to look stupid. So the point there is by call it cold calling on people like that, it makes it really rough. Even if you do know the answer, if you have a big classroom and you call on people, they might freeze. It makes it worse. So the answer I would give is you do it such that the introverts don't feel picked on and they feel like they're engaging. These types of things right here that we've just done, you know, if you've got, I've got some strong introverts friends. I personally am not all that introverted. Um, but some friends I have who are, if you put people into groups, think pair shares, talking it through like this, and then when I ask for, tell me something that's on your list, that's not intimidating because you could look down at the list and say, oh, what about this one? And then I can say, hey, good for you. I actually have had introverts who've told me that they like my class because they do well and they really feel like things are going well. But it's how you interact with them. Um, so that's the big one. So it's a really, really important one, being careful how you're in picking on people kind of thing is apparently big too. By the way, so quick, we had, I mean, so little time for this session. A couple of hours, it goes by pretty quickly. All I'm really trying to do is also get people to think about things they can do. If you take this task here, the concept that you can look at a piece of paper and read something off and it makes it less stressful, there's all kinds of implications. You, I could just say to the group, Psychology founded as a science. Let's see how many people can come up with the right date. First thing I want you to do is turn to your neighbor and between the two of you, see what kind of date you come up with. And then I give you literally 30 seconds to do that. So you turn to your neighbor and you say, I think it's around 1850. No, it's gotta be later than that. Let's go with 1870, 1875. Say, okay, that sounds, you know, between the two of us. Yeah, okay, good, we'll go 1875-ish. Now when I come around and say, okay, so what'd you guys come up with? I'm not cold calling on you. I'm saying, what did you come up with? An introvert can say, well, we got 1875 here. I say, well, that's pretty close, but no, sorry, that's not quite right. Let's go to the next group. That doesn't feel all that bad to me because now you worked on it as a pair. I'm not picking on you, but getting it wrong doesn't feel like it's a total failure, and your probability of getting it right goes way up because the two of you are more likely to get it or come close. So having students write things down before you call on them. If you don't want them to work in groups, telling you to take out the shyness and people who freeze in front of big groups, I always pre-ask my questions. I'm thinking about when psychology was founded as a science. Okay, my students know that's all they need to know. The next thing I'm going to ask them is, okay, so when was psychology founded as a science? But by kind of musing to myself, and I encourage them on the first day of class, I tell them this, whenever I ask questions like that, write it down. Now, if I do call on somebody, you can, and I'll tell you, it's the funniest thing. I'll say something along those lines of, uh, you know, who founded psychology as a science? And I'll watch people write like that, and then I'll call on somebody and say, so who do you got? And they'll say, um, Wundt. There was no reason for them to look at their paper. They just wrote it down. They looked down at it. They wrote it there. They're looking at me. They're answering the same question, but they suddenly realize there's 200 people around them. They'll look at the paper to make sure it's right. Um, so just kind of making it comfortable for them is good. Okay, moving on, because I'm bound and determined before this session ends to get to page two of the handout. Um, now, here's the deal. So you've, you've read off several things. Those are all really neat things that you have on your list. Oh, by the way, a technical college I was at just recently, wasn't too far from here either. A person raised their hand and said, when students climb into the ceiling tiles and hide. <laughs> Very good, he was teaching a shop class. 
he would leave, he'd come back, the students would climb up and hide in the ceiling tiles. Um, here's a quick one though. I had you brainstorm, and you preempted, this is good. Um, I had you brainstorm quickly because I didn't want you to debate the items on the list. Now what I could do, and I'm not going to do it for sake of time, there's so much things you could do with this little activity, that's why I like it, is you could go back and have the people talk about what's on the list and pick out which is the most important one, or what things don't belong in the list, or all kinds of stuff, but since they've brainstormed, they've got a lot of things on their list. We're going to jump right to this concept of attribution real quickly. Attribution, because you can't see in my head, it's attributing what it is I'm doing to something. If I'm walking along and I trip and fall, you could attribute that to clumsiness. And, and clumsiness would actually be an internal or dispositional attribution. Now, I, to anybody in here who teaches social psych or anything with attribution, I apologize. I'm going to cover about a week's worth of material in about four minutes. Um, but it's internal. That's my disposition. If I look at you and say, well, that's rude, and you say, ooh, you are one mean dude. That's an internal disposition. That's about my disposition. That's internal. If I trip and fall and you say, ooh, that must be slippery over there. That's external. It's something about the situation that made me fall. If I say, that's rude, and you look at me and say, oh, you know, I, you wouldn't normally do that. You can say this to your own self. You wouldn't normally do that. I bet you haven't been sleeping much or something's gone on with your life. You say, I just got to ask, are you all right? If you're asking me if I'm all right, you're, you're in your head making an attribution that there's a situation causing me to act that way. So as we look around at everybody's behavior, if somebody gets up and leaves early or comes in late, and we think, well, that's kind of discourteous or that's rude, we've just done an internal attribution. If somebody gets up and walks out and you think, oh, I hope they're okay, then you've just made an external situational attribution. By and large, we do something called a fundamental attribution error. And again, you can read about attributions. There's all kinds of nuances in this stuff. But a fundamental attribution error, and I don't think I have it there yet, nope, is that we tend to look at others and we think dispositionally. We tend to attribute our own behaviors to situational. My friend Milt Cox, is he outgoing? Nah, he's actually pretty reserved. He's a pretty reserved kind of guy. Am I outgoing? It depends. If it's teaching, I'm over the top outgoing. I've never tried acting, but I think I would be good at it. Um, I love being, I love doing these kinds of things and facilitating learning. Put me into another situation where the higher level, I don't know, trustees from the university and, uh, and, and elected officials, I don't know why, they just, they freak me out for some reason. So I don't ever talk. I've gone through entire dinners without saying a word, just sitting back. In fact, just fairly recently, somebody said to someone else, it got back to me, it's like, boy, that Todd's really quiet. <laughs> and my friend says, um, Todd who? <laughs> and he said, the one with the long last name. Still don't have anything, I'm not sure. Couldn't put me with that concept because she sees me as massively outgoing. I would say it depends. So now, you should be able to use this material more for teaching and learning. Sure, teaching and learning is good, but what about outside stuff? If you think about it, the next time you're into a really heated discussion with somebody, keep in mind that you tend to go dispositional on their behaviors. They're doing the same for you. You're thinking situational for your own behaviors, but they're thinking situational for their own behaviors. Now the discussion takes on a whole different look. Imagine how, how interesting this would become. So I come late for dinner, and my wife says, well, the least you could do is come on time. My thought all of a sudden is, well, wait a minute, there was heavy traffic, I had a million emails, I had to deal with a student, I had all these, I would have been here on time if I didn't have all this crap I had to do. And in her head, it's like, no, you're being rude. And I'll say, boy, you seem kind of snippy about that. And I'm thinking, you're kind of a snippy person right now. And she's thinking, of course I'm snippy right now. You're late. The kids have been really a fuss and mess. And my job was a hectic one, too. So she defaults into all of these um, situational things about why her mood is what it is. But I'm being mean. I'm thinking about you're being snippy and look at all the stuff. And you can see the discussion already has some problems with it. So a student who hands a paper in late, you're thinking right out of the gate, you know what, you need to learn to be responsible. The student is thinking, I would have handed this in had it been possible. So you have all these things going on in there. So one of the big things that's changed my life, quite frankly, is trying to give people the benefit of the doubt whenever possible because this is a fundamental thing we all tend to do as humans. And so what happens now is when a student does something or somebody else does something that I don't like, 
instead of automatically thinking disposition, I think, I'm wondering if there's a situational constraint that really pushed that. Now, here's the point. It may be dispositional. If somebody steps up and they're acting really snippy to you, it could be they're just a mean person. There are just mean people. But if you assume that's maybe situational, then find out they're a jerk. That's one direction. If you assume they're a jerk up front, which is a fundamental attribution error, and then find out that they have all these issues, then it's a little harder to recover from it. So what I'll often do with students is I'll say, you know, your paper is late, and you know, I'm really sorry, I have a policy. I have to adhere to the policy to be fair to everyone, but tell me what is it that happened to you? Now what I'm doing is I'm at least giving them the benefit of saying, letting them explain their situation, which is what they want to do, and then afterwards I can say, I really, really can appreciate what you've gotten into, but you know, it has to be a deadline. It's got to be fair to people, and I put a deadline in there on purpose. It changes the whole interaction. So this is an important one. Now we go back to the list, though. Suddenly we have this problem with this list. If they go to sleep in your class, is it because they're disinterested, not motivated, apathetic? Or maybe they just worked a double shift and their kids are sick. Could be they played video games all night and that's why they fell asleep. That's a problem. Could be they got called into work and they had to do the job or they would have gotten fired. That's not a problem, but it's a concern. So the point here is it takes on a whole different feel to it. Um, I still can't quite explain climbing into the ceiling tiles and hiding other than just being bored. But the point here is we just have to be careful what we say in terms of the students' behaviors. Um, Okay, this can lead to a lot of other things, by the way. Um, yeah, I, I'm going to try to do this very, very fast because it's just, it's, I, I look for things of why students do what they do, and I think that's the, the biggest lesson from this two hours, is if we just look at the student behavior and say, let's think about what's really happening here, and there's all kinds of stuff going on. So attribution is huge. Um, I've never done this start study, Martin Seligman did, but he's not a bad guy. He was just doing psychology back in the 60s. Um, so here it is. I apologize, but this was the study. This is electrified floor. No, it's OK. Um, and this is electrified over here. Here's a speaker or a light. It could go either way. And it's a little shuttle box. And here's the opening here for the dog. Tone comes. Bing. Three seconds later, a shot comes. Dog thrashes around and jumps over here. A little while, wait a few minutes. Tone comes up here. Bing! Three seconds later, shot comes. Dog thrashes around, jumps over. As the dog is jumping over, they're in what's called an escape paradigm. Something bad is happening. Floor is electrified. I'm getting out. So your bad situation, I want out. That's escape paradigm. Just remember escape paradigm. Now what will happen is after they do this just a few times, tone comes, bing, and about one second later the dog hops over here. I mean, you can count, bing, yikes, I'm getting out, so I come over here. Three seconds later, the floor over there is electrified, I never feel it. Tone comes, I get out of there, don't feel anything. Now I'm hopping back and forth, I never get shocked. Tone comes, I jump over here. Tone comes, I jump over here, no shocks. This is an avoidance paradigm. It was an escape because I wanted to get out of something negative. This one's avoidance. I want to avoid something. Here's what's cool. I can turn the shock off. If I turn the shock off, the dog doesn't stop jumping. Tone comes, I pop over here. Now I'm avoiding the perception of something bad, not the reality. Tone comes, I'm getting out of there. You require a, you require a speech in your class, I'm gone. <laughs> You have, to have, you have to have a stats class to get a major in psych. I'm switching over to here. See, the cool part is there's all these things that happen in class. I have to come in for a review session before I can actually do that thing. No, thanks. All this is perception of what's happened to them in the past. They're not going to deal with it. The avoidance part, of course, is that you've got the grade that's uh, like a D minus and you study really, really hard. You can pass. You know what? I've had enough. I'm getting out. That's an escape out of a negative situation versus avoidance huge for teaching and learning stuff, especially first-generation college students, um, all kinds of things going on here. But if a student starts to jump out of a situation because they want to avoid the perception that's a problem, that's where you can step in. I've had speeches in my class where students have come to me with a drop slip. Now yeah, I'm going to drop because I can't do a speech in front of public. I just can't do it. I say, okay, what can you do? I love the looks on their face. What do you mean, what can I do? So, well, you can't do a speech in front of the group. What can you do? 
So I don't understand the question, sir. <laughs> Say, I need to evaluate whether or not you can pull material together and present it to others. Can you give me an alternative? Well, I could do an online kind of wiki blog type of thing, and then I could do this and this, and I could explain it to people, but I can't do an actual speech. Say, you know what? Good enough. In fact, that's a really good idea. I'm going to offer it to everybody. It's a different tone in the classroom. But the reason is, I know what the avoidance paradigm looks like. If the person just avoids it in my class, they're going to avoid it in the next, and the next, and the next. I had one student, this is my favorite one, very fast. She came in, she said, I got to drop the class. It was just before the first test in stats. I have to drop the class. I can't pass the test because I can't take tests in stats class. I said, then why are you in here? I knew her a little bit. She said, well, because I have to have the class to graduate. I said, but if you keep dropping it, you can't ever graduate. Yeah, I'm going to try it again next semester. I said, how many times have you tried it thus far? And she said, this is my fourth time. So in four, and those actually it wasn't semesters, this was back in the quarter system, this is a long time ago. Four quarters in a row that she had started, and she was doing this. The tone was coming, first exam, and she was getting out of there. First exam, I'm getting out of here. So I told her, I said, I'll tell you what, let's just do an oral test instead of the written test. She said, I can't do those either. As soon as you start to evaluate me, I freak out. So OK, give me one shot. This was my favorite. I've got to tell you this because I love this story. So give me one shot for the first exam, plenty of time to drop the class. You come in and talk to me about this stuff three times a week. Monday, Wednesday, and Friday was the class. After class, let's talk through the material. And then I will give you an oral exam on the first one. If you don't do well with it, you're out of here. No harm done. She said, OK. We did that. She showed up for the first exam. She was sweaty, <laughs> just kind of freaking out. And I said, have a seat. I said, I need to talk to you. And she sat down. I said, OK, you ready to get started? She said, yes. I said, OK, B minus. She said, what? I said, you have a B minus. Congratulations, you have a B minus. She said, I don't understand what you're talking about. I said, you know all those times, those conversations we had? Every time when you left, I wrote a grade down. And so far, you, you, know, you had some Fs, you had some As, you had some Bs, some Cs, but you got a B minus. And now I know this was like 20 years ago. Today, I'm not sure I would do the same gig. But the point is, she then was funny because she said, I have a B minus in stats class? I got to go call my mom. <laughs> and she went to call her mom. And then we came back. And we, by the end of the semester, she did a couple of oral exams. She took the written final exam in the classroom. She was sweaty that day. And she scored like a D, but she did it. And the point was that we worked through this scenario of kind of little by little edging her. Now, I, I, again, I wouldn't suggest you should do that. What I'm saying is I recognize that middle, that first point where she was just avoiding it. And it wasn't just that she didn't want to do the work. It was it had some history to it. The other one, by the way, is the, um, the misattribution. I talked about attributions and how we attribute things. There's also misattributions that we have to be careful with. Um, for instance, real quick study. You all have insomnia. You can't sleep. For this side, I give, you a I give you all placebos. For this side, I give you the placebo and say, here's a sleeping pill, it will help you sleep. For this side, here's a sleeping pill, it will help you sleep. But it has some side effects. It's going to make you feel a little bit jittery, and it's going to raise your heart rate just a little bit. But by and large, it's going to help you fall asleep. Now, you probably all know, or most of you know, where insomnia can come from frequently. It's people who lay down saying, OK, I haven't been able to sleep lately, but I really got to get a good night's sleep. It's really, really important. Oh, it's midnight. If I go to sleep right now, I can still get six hours worth of sleep. Oh, it's one o'clock. If I can get to sleep right now, I can still get five hours of sleep. And finally, out of sheer exhaustion, they doze off at about 4.30ish. Um, the point is, or you wake up in the morning, and it's a million things running through your head. You can't get back to sleep. So this pill is going to help you, but it's a placebo. What's cool is the people were told it's going to raise your heart rate and make you feel jittery. They go to sleep significantly faster because they can attribute that anxiety to the pill instead of their general life, how am I supposed to get through all of this? And it's a, it's a well-documented study, but here's, the, here's one direct, directly into academe. Students who fail, and I'm a first-generation college student, so I can tell you right now, huge, huge issue of first-generation college students if they flunk their first test. Because here's what mine was like. I got an F minus minus. Yeah. How do you get an F minus minus? I didn't know. So I went to my chemistry professor. I said, excuse me, Dr. Jones, I'll tell you his name because I don't like him. <laughs> Plus it was, I'm sure he's passed on long, long ago. Um, but Dr. Jones, I don't understand, an F minus minus. And he looked right at me and he said, huh, getting an F minus minus, that doesn't surprise me. Ooh, doesn't surprise him that I couldn't understand what an F minus minus meant since I got an F minus minus. Isn't that cool? He was a gem. <laughs> he said, here's the deal. 
90% is an A minus, 80% is a B minus, 70% is a C minus, 60% is a D minus. You scored like a 43%. You should have actually gotten a G minus, but I'm pretty sure that would have freaked you out. <laughs> so I said, okay, thank you. So it was an F minus minus. What he wanted to show me was, and this is an important one, if you score a 50% on your first test, well, let's do worse than that. Let's do a, I just talked to a student who got a 30% on the first test, but they were going to pull their grade up. First question, how does your instructor calculate grades? Do they put in letters or numbers? Because it's hugely important. If you put in letters, you have an F, which means the next grade being an A would have a C average. If you put in numbers, if you've got a 30 and you come back with, oh, let's say a 100%, 100% is a 100 plus your 30 is 130. Divide that by 2, you get 65. Your F and your A gives you a D average because of the way the point's structured. If you miss a test, if you take a 0 on a paper and get a 0 on 100 points and then come back and score 100% on the exam that's worth 100 points, your average between your F and your A is an F because your average would be 50. In fact, an F minus minus. Um, so students don't always grab that, so you have to help them with that one. But here's the deal. If students who did poorly on their first test were shown a video, and this is in the reference list at the end, um, were shown a video of a student who was a senior who flunked his first test. And what he said was, look, this is serious. You should not take it lightly, but it happened to me. I'm now graduating. You can graduate. And the reason is these students who are first generation, and all students can go through it, but the first generation college students can easily say, maybe I'm not good enough to be here. The misattribution is misattributing that I'm not smart enough to pass the classes at this school, therefore maybe I should just move on. I was in the process of dropping out of school because I just figured, in fact, the words of my mother echoed in my mind. We're not sure that anybody is smart enough for college, but if anyone could make it, Todd can. There's no weight there. <laughs> and so I went off to school, got the F minus minus and thought, yep, she was right. I can't make it either. We're just not college people. Wrapping that last chunk up there, attribution. Be very careful how we're attributing the behaviors, both for ourselves and for our students. The activity can be used to generate all kinds of classroom activity and do stuff. Um, I want to still try this thing. I know our timing is a little light, but here's the deal. Everybody needs one quick index card. I keep using the word quick. I don't know why, but it's bugging me now. One index card each. Pass those around as fast as you can. Here's what I've got for you. This is an activity I use in classes all the time when I just can't quite seem to get the students rolling, and especially early in the semester. Really good early in the semester. Everybody got one? Okay, here's the activity. Once you, you just explain it to your students, they can take out a piece of paper. I'm giving the cards because I want to tell you up front what I'm going to do with these things. I'm going to ask you a prompt about teaching and learning. I'm going to collect these cards. The reason I collect the cards is I'm going to ask you what struggles you have with teaching and learning. I read through the cards. I give a summary to your Center for Teaching and Learning that allows Jed to say, ooh, we should have workshops on a couple of these topics. So it actually helps out for his activities. It helps me out because I know what types of things you might actually find useful in your teaching and learning. Everything that you have seen so far have been on people's cards over and over and over again. So that's why I'm doing that part. So that's the disclaimer. Now, back to the classroom. In the classroom, once they understand the situation, you can say, take out a piece of paper, we're going to do the paper passing thing. Just call it that, you'll be fine. You just need to tell them the first time. What we're going to do is we're going to write down stuff on these cards, and you're going to pass them around the room such that nobody's going to know whose card ends up where. Then we're going to discuss what's on the cards. That allows us to have a conversation about all of the stuff in the room, but disentangled from the individual who's thinking it. So we don't have to worry about that anymore. It makes for some great conversations. So you can just tell them that it works out typically pretty well for that. However, if you're the only person in a room with a big purple pen, don't write with a big purple pen. If you have very, very distinct handwriting, I would suggest you print. If there's anything that would allow a person to look at that card and know it's you, just do something so they can't tell that. And Although the statistics are not high for this one, in this size group, there is a chance that somebody will get their own card back. Nobody will know unless you say, hey, look, I got my own card back. <laughs> if it bothers you, you have your own card, pass it one more time and get rid of it. Otherwise, you keep it, and when you sit down, you can say, ooh, this one's interesting, <laughs> and then you make sure that it gets discussed. So the first time you explain it will take literally a minute, 
and the activity itself only takes a couple of seconds to do. So here's the deal. You write on the cards, we're going to pass them to six other people as quickly as you can so that it moves fast, and then we'll sit down and talk about what's on the cards. If you really want to talk about engagement in the classroom, do you need to be there? Or do, I'm sorry, not you, do the students need to be there? If you can deliver your class and teach your class without any students, and it wouldn't look much different, then you can't get frustrated if they're not participating because that's what you're kind of expecting. So the point is just watching that. Now, back to the activity because we got, kind of got off there just a little bit. Sorry about that. Um, but I'm not going to go through more of these because we're just about out of time. The most important thing is, is, number one, you guys were coming up with some really good ideas on your own. Even in your small clusters as I was walking around, you were coming up with some great things. If you ever catch yourself saying, oh, I just the tendon seems to be slipping and I'm not sure why, Catch a couple of colleagues and take them to lunch. It's really well worth the money. And just say, hey, can we talk about attendance stuff? Or just asking around a little bit. The point is, you've got lots of stuff in the room here that can help one another. In terms of an activity, you saw very quickly the activity takes off. You get a lot of discussion. The students who are petrified that what they may have to say isn't really consistent with what others might say, or I don't want to look stupid, you can't look stupid in this thing. You're writing on a card and passing it around. The ones who don't are kind of reluctant to talk, the back row kind of students even, is that they have their little clusters and then you can wander around like I did and wander by them. If they're not on task, bump them on task. But the point is it really gets people talking. Um, I've used this one lots and lots of times. It tends to work well. Now, before I forget, there's another one that could tag into this one. It could go to almost any activity you do though. If you ever run into a situation where I'm calling on groups, for instance, and I get to a group, and we'll just pick on these guys right here, and they say, um, yeah, sorry, we didn't really get to the task, that deal where they don't have anything to report out, you always have people report out because that holds the group accountable. Be very careful about doing a task like this then saying, okay, we're at the end of the hour, so we'll pick this up on Wednesday. Because you've just demonstrated that had they not participated, it would have been okay. So you hold them accountable by calling on groups, asking for volunteers, writing a short summary, somehow hold them accountable. But if a group says, yeah, sorry, we didn't get to it, I'm a very, proact I'm very proactive towards students and pro-students. So I try to, and I mean that seriously, I try to really watch out for students, but part of that is not always being, letting them off. It's the same type of thing with kids and everything else. Workers, I do the same thing. If I've got employees and they didn't do their job and I say, well, that's okay, try harder next time. It doesn't help them. It doesn't help the whole situation. So I don't let them off. If this group said, yeah, we didn't get to it, I would be very positive. I would say, you know what? Focusing and getting to the end of a task can be very challenging. Hang around after class. I got some great tips for you. OK, next group. Now, I did that publicly, not quietly. If I did it quietly off to the side, then you guys would all think they got away with it, even if I caught them after class. If, however, I chastise them and yell at them, then that's a bad tone for everybody. If I do it like I just did it, you all can go, ooh, and kind of smile. You know it's not a big deal, but they also didn't get away with it. Then when I finish class, and I've done this with groups of 200 people, where I've had groups, and then I call on groups, and a group off to the side said, yeah, Dr. Z, sorry, we were talking about the parties this weekend. I didn't get to the task. Said, hey, no problem. After class, you and I will chat a little bit about some techniques for staying on task. And then I finished my class, kept talking. We did the lecture, did a little more activities and stuff. And at the end of class, I'd say, okay, everybody, well, make sure you read chapter three for tomorrow. And or, I guess I'll see you. Any questions? No questions? Great. See you later. Okay, you guys. Now they all pack up and we just chat real quickly. So why didn't you get there? Is it, did you have a problem? What's the issue? All I need to do is hold them up for about 15 seconds. And I can say, okay, don't worry about it. It sounds like you're right on track. That's enough. I'm not going to make them late for their next class. I'm not going to chastise them. I'm not going to make it mean. It's just holding them accountable. And it, it actually has worked really, really well. OK, that whole activity. The other thing it did, do you notice when you got up and moved around, it felt good just to move? Um, just kind of moving around and changing it up again is really good. These are heart rates across the class period um, from a book called What's the Use of Lectures. Now, this isn't zero down here. Don't worry, they're not dying. Um, <laughs> But through a class period, it can, it can drop off pretty considerably. And what can happen, this is another one with heart rates, is something like an observation or a simulation, an intervention. I love this, intervention by a student, not a question. It's an intervention. Please, let me stop you from what you're doing. Um, but even that, a student asking a question can kind of generate a little bit more interest. So the point there is that um, 
just this activity can be used to mix it up. It works out really well, like in a night class or a long period class. You want to see this thing? I can show it to you. All right, here's the deal. I was first shown this many, many years ago. Go to the newspaper, and it's a couple step process. First thing you need, when you look at the newspaper, you got to find an article that's full justified. That's really important. And the longer the better. So something that runs down the side of the article. Oh my word, that has Duke on it. Um, I have learned to dislike them and I still don't know why. Okay, here's a good article here. It's a long article, it's full justified, so that article would work well. So number one, finding a long article that's like that. So I had mine that was like this one. Okay, those of you who believe in magic, this isn't real magic, so I'm sorry. It's just sad. <laughs> I take my article and my heading. I turn the article upside down. Now this article is upside down. And then I tape it back on there. Once I tape it back on there, this would be right side up. Now I look at this one and I think, What's a good word? And I look down the front one. Here's financial, governors, federal, avoid. Ooh, I like avoid. So I'm just going to rip this instead of cutting it to show you what happens here. So see, I just ripped that. Imagine that was a nice clean cut. Now I tape it. I show up with my article and I say, OK, everybody. And you can see what's going to happen. It doesn't matter where I cut it. When it falls to the ground, you will pick it up, turn it around to the top, and say, ooh, avoid. So it doesn't matter where the cut happens. Now, a couple of quick caveats on this thing. I'm showing you this because I was shown as a teaching demonstration a long time ago is a way to get students talking in the classroom. So it's not like you're not supposed to generally push this out to everybody, but you can use it in your classes. Um, but you have to be careful, of course, there's enough of you in here if somebody else has already done it. Yeah. Here's the deal. You have to be careful if the back is another article. When I started, I said, let me put a line through this. I drew a pen. I drew a line through the back of the article. Because if avoid was the word and they pick it up, here's one, there was an article on the back. And instead of, what do we have, financial? If instead of financial, they'd picked it up and said, face. I would say, um, could you turn it over? And they'd turn over and say, oh, if I turn it over, financial. Ta-da! <laughs> Not nearly as powerful. So I drew a blue line through the one side and said, no, the side without the blue line on it. So there it is. Um, so that's the big one. The best way to do that, to get away from that issue, is to use the USA Today for your article. Because there's about a 90% chance if you find an article in the USA Today, on the back side is an advertisement. <laughs> the paper's almost all advertisements, and then you don't have to deal with that. 